Good morning. I'm Martha Johnson, director of the Mayor Museum of Art at Randolph College. And I'd like to welcome you to the 31st annual Helen Clark Berlin Symposium. We will begin this morning by acknowledging the land Randolph College occupies was inhabited by Yessa, the people. But due to warfare, disease, forced migration, assimilation, and broken treaties, the people were reduced in number and were forced to a fraction of the land they once occupied. Today, descendants of the original people of the land, the Monacans, quote, understand that the land is the people and the people are the land, and we are not strangers on any of the land that we once considered our territory, unquote. They are not relics of the past. They live among us, and we honor them. The Berlin Symposium is always held in conjunction with the college's annual exhibition of contemporary art. The first annual opened at the college in 1911. It's the longest running series of original exhibitions of contemporary art staged annually by an academic institution. Before we get started, I would like to thank Mary Gray Shockey, class of 1969 and former trustee, who has generously supported every annual exhibition since the 100th, including this, the 111th annual exhibition, Survivance, Contemporary Native Art. On the occasion of the 80th annual exhibition, Friends and Family of Helen Clark Berlin, class of 1958, established a symposium in her honor, which would expand and extend the educational impact of the exhibition. This year's symposium is focused on Michael Naminga, one of four artists featured in Survivance. We are surrounded today by his work and the work of Cara Romero, Diego Romero, and Virgil Ortiz. It's been an honor to live with these objects for a few months. They have enriched all who enter here, and we are deeply grateful to Cara, Diego, Virgil, and Michael for their creativity and generosity in allowing us this opportunity. Our celebration today is in two parts. The first is Michael's presentation now, where we will see uh, some of his work not included in Survivance and learn more about the photographs that are included in the exhibition. Then at 2 o'clock, we will return for a conversation with Michael, where we will learn more about his artistic legacy, his practice, and his process. It will be an informal dialogue, and we'll be happy to take questions. Michael Naminga is a Tewa Hopi artist who earned a degree in strategic design and management from the Parsons School of Design in New York. His current work is inspired by opera set design and how those structures played with a perspective using angles, hue, and value. Naminga creates distorted illusions to comment on climate change, especially the effects of fires on ancestral lands in the Southwest. He has exhibited in numerous solo and group exhibitions since 2009, and his work is in many public and private collections, including the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Hood Museum of Art at Dartmouth, the George O'Keefe Museum in Santa Fe, and the Denver Art Museum. Please join me in welcoming Michael Naminga. Hello. Uh, my name is Michael Naminga. Thank you for coming today. Um, I also wanted to recognize my fellow artists that are not with us today, uh, Caro Romero, Diego Romero, and Virgil Ortiz. And also, there is a piece in the exhibition um, by Jean Quick to see Smith to my left here, who I look up to and admire her work. Um, and I think of her as a true badass and door opener for us Native American artists. Um, so I wanted to start my presentation 
today uh, sort of with where I began my exploration into um, what is happening with my environment in the American West. Um, Oh, let me turn this on. Um, so going back to some of my family heritage, my great, great, great grandmother um, was a well-known Hopi potter by the name of Nampeo. And this is a photograph of her taken by Edward Curtis in 1905. Um, this is one of a few photographs that Edward um, took of her. And unfortunately, I don't know through the grapevine of my family <laughs> what her, her experience was like to sit for Edward Curtis, um, because it would be fascinating to understand that given, I think, a lot of the controversy that surrounds his portrait work, um, how a lot of people say they're staged, and if you know she was truly working, I can see that she's using a piece of yucca to apply the paint to that piece that she has in her hand. Um, so my great-great-great-grandmother, Nampeo, um, she also, around the same time in 1905, was, I guess you could call an artist in residence um, at one of Fred Harvey's hotels in the West um, that was located on the South Rim, well, it's still there, the South Rim of the Grand Canyon, and I think the name is El Tovar. But he built it in, I think, 1903, 1904, and he added a structure to the property called um, Hopi House. And so my great, great, great grandmother and grandfather lived there and she would create pottery pieces and um, sell them to visiting tourists. And so I come from a long line of Hopi pottery makers. And my father, Dan Naminha, is a painter, sculptor, and printmaker who has been um, working professionally as an artist since 1970. And so he was one of the first in my family to branch off from working in ceramics. Um, and then my brother, uh, Arlo Naminha, also became an artist. And he works in uh, stone, wood, and bronze. And then I um, became an artist, uh, I guess, in the late 2000s um, after a stint at Parsons School of Design, where I did not study art. I went because I thought I wanted to be the next Tom Ford. Um, that clearly did not happen, but I... Um, I looked up to creative directors and what they envisioned and how they are able to create almost sort of like this branding, this style, and I guess in a sense, um, that's also what artists do um, because they do create an aesthetic and they stick to it and they, it's something I guess they become known for, but they also nowadays really brand themselves um, so starting with the Galisteo Basin series, um, this is a landscape located in New Mexico that is about 30 miles south of Santa Fe. And it's this very beautiful, picturesque area. And going back to Tom Ford, um, this is a shot looking at what used to be his ranch. And um, so I was driving out there chasing a storm. It was a, a rainstorm. And the light at that time of day was just kind of perfect. And I didn't really have any idea what I was in search of other than taking a pretty picture. 
And so I got out there, I jumped out of my car, and I started taking photographic images. And um, I got what I wanted, and on my drive home, I observed all of these signs along the side of the road that said, no drilling in Galisteo, um, no oil in Lamy. And so that kind of piqued my interest. I wasn't quite sure what was going on. And so I started to look on the internet um, about oil and gas in the town of Lamy. And I discovered that for a number of years, uh, the residents of this tiny village of Galisteo have been fighting with oil and natural gas companies that wanted to establish an oil and natural gas infrastructure because through their research, they discovered that the Galisteo Basin sits on top of a huge pool of oil. Um, and there is a very well-known writer named Lucy Lepard that lives in Galisteo base in Ga the village of Galisteo. And so she has been very vocal in her opposition of these oil companies moving in. And so I started to think about what I wanted to convey with my photographs about that area. And so this block of color represents a piece of the landscape that may not be there someday. And I started to research color psychology and discovered that the color pink is often used to calm people down. I read that um, drunk tanks are often painted the interior pink so that the people that are arrested, will um, they can calm them down. And also that opposing football teams Sometimes they'll paint the opposing team's uh, locker room pink so that they won't be so jazzed up for their, their game. Um, and so in the series, I, I chose different colors that have those effects on people just because that was the experience I was getting from being in that landscape. And I went to school in New York City. I lived there for a while. And I discovered that I was surrounded by a lot of um, artificial landscape. And they say it takes moving away from a place to truly understand and appreciate what you had. And so when I came back to New Mexico, I realized just how much I really loved and missed being in this landscape and just how rapidly it was changing. Um, so this is also from the Galisteo Basin series. Um, but in looking at photography, I was frustrated with it. And I was frustrated with it being confined to a square or a rectangle. And so I wanted to experiment with ways I could remove it from that. And I've been playing with Photoshop since I was a teenager. And um, I guess that came in handy one day. And so I also attend a lot of opera. And um, I started to look at set designers and how a set designer will skew a set to trick the eye. And a lot of times there's these like forced perspectives and some of them are a little bit distorted. And so that always kind of piqued my interest. And so I started to also look at artists like Ellsworth Kelly or Ronald Davis and um, how they would paint on shaped panels. And uh, Ronald Davis in particular would really create these sense of illusion out of um, some of his paintings in the 70s. And so I wanted to take that all of those kind of inspiration and apply it to photography. And so I started to experiment with shape. And I wasn't sure how I was going to go about even creating these. And I had experimented with using uh, circular images. And I took it to my fabricator. And I said, can you cut this out? And can we print this in a circle? And he said, absolutely. And so then after that was finished, I came back with this and I said, well, since you could print on a circle, can we do this 
other shape? And he said, well, I don't know. <laughs> Let me see. Um, so this particular piece had about six or seven experiments, and some of them cracked. Um, the plexiglass cracked just because of the stress. Uh, some of them, the image was off, um, so like the router didn't match up with the image. And so in the end, we finally got to where we needed to be, and then I just was like, well, let me see how many more of these I can create. Um, and so in 2017, the Georgia O'Keeffe Museum invited me to exhibit. Um, they have a program called Contemporary Voices, where they invite contemporary living artists to create a body of work in response to O'Keeffe's work. And going back to Parsons, um, my sophomore art history class, we were going, I was observing the professor shuffle through slides on American modernism. And he came upon a painting by O'Keeffe um, and he paused at it and he said, this is Georgia O'Keeffe, it's called Black Place series, blah, blah, blah. And the, the painting really struck me because I thought it was two cloud formations with rain coming down the center and you know, just very idyllic romantic vision. Um, and fast forward to 2017 when I was talking to the curator about that series, she said, no, that's, those aren't cloud formations, that's a landscape. Um, and it's located here in New Mexico, it's in the Four Corners region. It was a series that O'Keeffe called The Black Place and she painted it in 1930 to 1940. There's 12 paintings of it. Um, and we can look at it more closely if you'd like. And so I started to research it and um, her photographs or her paintings started out very uh, much a landscape. I mean, there was a foreground and sky and the horizon, but as you moved through the series, they became more and more abstract. And so that's what piqued my interest in the series. Um, and so I asked the curator that I worked with on this exhibit, Carolyn Kastner, um, where is this place located? How can I find it? How can I research it? And the O'Keeffe Museum has the GPS coordinates of where O'Keeffe used to drive out and camp. And so I use those um, to enter into Google Earth. And I started to look at um, just how large of an area it is and realize it's not a very large area. But I also looked closer, zooming in and out on the landscape and noticed um, there's a bunch of parking lots or what look like parking lots to me scattered throughout the area. And so I asked Carolyn, um, why are there all these parking lots? <laughs> and she said, those aren't parking lots, those are oil and natural gas infrastructure. And um, around 2017, leading up to that, it started out pretty small and now it, it's pretty massive. Um, and so then I started to look at oil and, gas, oil and gas extraction in the Four Corners region of New Mexico. And in 2014, NASA did a study of methane gas emissions and discovered the largest methane gas cloud in North America sits over this region. And it showed up on their satellite images as red, pink, and yellow. And so this is an image of the US and that um, area in the black square is the uh, methane emissions that NASA picked up. And so these are a couple of images from that exhibition. The image on the left, Black Place 7, um, I used Google Earth, that is a Google Earth image of the um, area known as the Black Place, and then this piece, uh, Black Place 11, um, 
is a drone shot that I took that's a close-up of the hills. And the red is um, in reference to that methane gas cloud. And what I discovered was um, using a drone really helped me get up close and personal with this landscape without actually having to interact with it or leave my mark on it. Because I also discovered that it's a very fragile landscape. You step on it, you leave a footprint, and it's just kind of there for a while until it rains. Um, this is a video of um, Black Place 10. Often when I'm giving presentations, I don't have the luxury always to be in the same room as my works. And so I was told that a way to convey my message of kind of the three-dimensionality three of my work is to make a little video. Um, so this is just moving around the image. And so you can see kind of how the pieces tend to uh, shift shape. And this piece has different mounting points on the back because when I was creating it compositionally, it doesn't really necessarily have a true up or down to it. And when I was talking to the curator about that, she said, oh, that's really interesting that you did that because O'Keefe did that on some of her paintings. So if you flip them around, she would put um, a hanging wire on the back so that you could hang it either vertically or horizontally. Um, so moving on from the Black Place series, I was part of uh, an incubator program for artists at the New Museum in New York City in 2018 to 2019. And it was an incubator for artists that are working in art and technology. And I was probably the most analog out of the artists that were there. Everyone that was working there were either doing virtual reality or augmented reality or you know, much more ingrained in technology than I could ever want to be. Um, so, it was also a little bit frustrating for me <laughs> to be creating a series of work or working on a body of work that was so based in where I come from, which is the American West and living in Manhattan. And I love Manhattan, I love New York, I've lived there for a long time, but I just, I wasn't quite clicking, like there wasn't something grabbing me. And so every year in Manhattan around um, between like May and June leading up to the summer solstice, they have this thing they call Manhattan Henge. And it's basically like a celestial calendar, but they use buildings on all of the big avenues. Um, like it's 23rd Street, um, 14th Street, 34th Street. And so what happens is the sun lines up perfectly between the buildings and it becomes like this great photo opportunity. Um, and so I was, this shot I took on May 31st. Um, I was on my way to dinner and I noticed that all these cars cabs, like people, you can see them, had all stopped in the, the road to take this photograph. And I thought that's so random because, you know, stopping people in New York is kind of a, a, a hard thing to do. So I came around the corner and I thought, oh my God, I can see why, what they're photographing. So the sun was this like incredibly gradient sky and the sun itself was this really crazy red orange color it was so vivid um this was taken on one of my old iphones so the image is not that great um but i had learned the next day that the reason why the sky was so vivid and so unusual was because um there were some fires in canada that had drifted the smoke had drifted down and settled around Manhattan. And so it altered the landscape and altered the sunset that we were seeing. And so 
at that point, something finally clicked, and I was like, okay, now I have my body of work I can work on. So I embarked on my Altered Landscape series, and so I started to think about the fire season in the West and how every June in New Mexico, like clockwork, it smells like forests burning and you start to see these sunsets that are unreal, beautiful to look at, stunning, but there's just something a little bit off about them. Um, and let me just go back. Um, so some of these altered landscape sunsets uh, are behind you. Um, and so I altered the sky so that they are unreal, but I also started to look at the air quality index colors. And because when there is the, the forest fires and this forest fire season, um, we live according to the air quality index and what is safe to go outside. And recently, um, I, I've been living in California where there are also a lot of forest fires. And um, the other day in the desert, there was this massive dust storm and the air quality index usually in New Mexico during forest fire seasons on the worst day is 140. During this dust storm in California, it was 480, which I had never seen before. And the color scale went all the way up to purple, which I didn't even know it did. Um, but I also started to learn that like, so much of our lives is dictated by these color coding systems. And then after this series was done, we went into COVID. And so we were living by these color systems about when it was safe to interact with other people. Um, and so then I changed to my Chaco series, which was around the same time as um, COVID. Uh, so I was scheduled to fly to New York City that first week of March 2020. Um, I had some friends whose photographic collection was going on exhibit at the Metropolitan Museum and um, the whole family was going and they invited all their friends, including me, to go. And um, I was on my way to the airport and leading up to that, you know, we kept hearing these stories about this new variant and this new thing called COVID that was going around and people were getting, but we didn't quite know what it was yet. And so we were driving down to the airport. I turned to my partner and I said, are you comfortable going to New York? And he said, no, not really. And I said, okay, good, because I'm not either. So we parked in the cell phone lot and called, made sure we could cancel our reservations. And then I emailed my friends and um, I told them, I'm so sorry, but we're just, we're not going to make it. Um, have a great time. And he sent me a message back and he said, that's fine, totally understand it. Did COVID scare you? And I learned that that event turned into one of those super spreaders. And so a lot of people caught it, including my friends that I emailed with. And two weeks later, he passed away from it. And then a week after that, his wife died. And so I was touched by COVID really early on in the pandemic. And so that's when I started this series on Chaco Canyon. And so um, I drove out to Chaco, which is located again in the Four Corners region of New Mexico. And it's not far from the Black Place area. Um, and it's this 1,000 year old ancient structure where my ancestors come from. Um, and the place is very spiritual to us in the area. Um, and it's on this 20 
mile long dirt road. It takes forever to get there, and, but I think the National Park Service kept, keeps it that way to deter people from, too many people from visiting. Um, so when you go out there, it's sort of like stepping back in time. It's like going back a thousand years. And so the day we were out there, it was very atmospheric. It was raining. It was kind of this light drizzle, and there was this cloud cover. And so I was taking photographic images, not really quite sure what I was going for, but I knew I wanted to record this. And so when we came back from the area, um, we drove through Albuquerque and stopped at a place to eat. And we sat down, and we were in this restaurant, and all of these tables had been separated. Like, there was very few people out, and they had you know, started to clean everything with disinfectant, which I think we all started to do. But in a sense, for me, it felt like going out to Chaco, I had stepped back in time, and I had gone through some sort of time warp. And when I came back to this restaurant, it was like I had stepped into another world. And like the world had changed in that time that I was out there. And so the piece on the left represents that. It represents this kind of my world being flipped upside down. And um, what I used to know was no longer familiar. And we were embarking on something new and something changed. And I didn't quite sure, I wasn't quite sure how to capture it. Um, and so that was more an emotional piece. The piece on the right is um, Fajada Butte, and it's the first, I guess, sort of landmark you encounter when you drive out to Chaco Canyon. And it appears from the car, this little teeny tiny butte, and as you get closer, it kind of increases in size. But the cool thing about Fajada Butte is that it houses um, a celestial calendar that the um, inhabitants of it created, and it is called the Sun Dagger, and it's a, a pretty large um, petroglyph that's carved into the side here. And it is a petroglyph of what the Hopi call a sipapu, which is the center of the earth, and it's a spiral. And so in front of that spiral petroglyph are three stone slabs. And on the summer solstice, the light of the sun shines through it and creates this light dagger through the center, marking that it is the summer solstice, and it works for the winter solstice, fall solstice, and spring solstice as well. However, in the late 70s, uh, an archaeologist came upon it, and no one had recognized it since a thousand years ago, and so it's sort of like this new thing for archaeologists. And so um, many archaeologists were excited rightfully so, about it. And so they would make all these treks up there to do research on it. And by going up there, um, it allowed all of these footprints. And so those footprints created this erosion. And so those stone slabs shifted. And so those are no, it's no longer usable as a celestial calendar. Um, so now we are moving on to my Altered Landscape Series 3, which is um, recording um, our fire season in New Mexico, but with images of actual fires. And so last year, New Mexico had its largest forest fire on record. Um, called the Hermit's Peak Fire, and it burned, I think, 385,000 acres. And it was such a massive fire that lasted from April of 2022 until August of 2022. Um, and so I live in Santa Fe, and this fire was located 
to the west of Santa Fe. And so this shot was literally taken looking from our back patio west. And then this image is to the east of us. And this is a photograph of a pyrocumulonimbus cloud. And a pyrocumulonimbus cloud is a cloud that is created during forest fires. And it's um, a cloud that is created by the massive heat that is being produced on the earth surface from the fire. And it creates this large plume. And what it does is it sucks up all of this heat and ash and creates basically its own weather system. So in addition to this forest fire burning below you, you're having this gigantic anvil-shaped cloud above you that is raining down all of the stuff that has been sucked up and um, is toxic and uh, released through rain and lightning storms. And so I witnessed, I think, about five of these during the course of that um, forest fire. And this piece in particular, I drove kind of all around, um, I guess, like 80 miles out of my way and then 80 miles out of my other way in order to get the angle that I was looking for for this cloud. Um, and when you look at it up closely, you can see there are some birds that are flying around it. And I just wanted to include that just because it, it, it almost seems so serene, but it's really not. Um, this is a piece I did for the Santa Fe Botanical Garden. So sometimes as an artist, you're also invited to participate in an exhibition that's kind of outside what you're usually, what you're comfortable with. And so since it's a botanical garden, it was an exhibition uh, to exhibit sculptures, outdoor sculptures. And so it was an exhibit with my father and my brother. And since my father's a sculptor and my brother's a sculptor, great work for them. For me, not so much. Um, so I wasn't quite sure how to tackle that idea. And so I have a friend, she's a writer. Her name is Terry Tempest Williams, and she writes about nature. And she was giving a talk in Santa Fe, and she began her talk um, just saying these words, acorn, ash, buttercup, dandelion, fern, and the list kind of went on. And she said, these are all words that have been recently removed from the Oxford Junior Dictionary. And I thought, oh my God, that is such a powerful statement. Um, but how do I translate that into a work of art? And so I began to look around the botanical garden. And the botanical garden, usually for whatever plant or tree you're looking at, has a little marker that gives you the species, the climate, whatever it is that you're looking at. And so um, I created all of some of those words that were removed from the Oxford Junior Dictionary. And I um, had them placed on these markers that usually mark the species of plant. And I had them assembled in a very barren part of the um, garden in the shape of a zero, since zero represents the absence of value, since the Oxford Junior Dictionary sees no value in including these words. Um, and when I think about it, it's really interesting that these are all words that kids would read about because the Oxford Junior Dictionary is for kids. And they replace them with words like MP3 player, um, blog, <laughs> all of chat room, broadband. 
I mean, MP3 player is like, does anyone have an MP3 player anymore? But anyways, they've replaced them with words, works for their x and the, and the mirror image and what people see because in Rorschach's people see different things. Um, and so a lot of times you'll see in some of my compositions, the photographs are mirror images of each other just layered on top of each other in different ways. Um, and so that's what you're seeing here. And so I create these compositions in Photoshop um, and I scale them up or scale them to whatever proportion I would like to see the final product. Are they printing on uh, multiple pieces of acrylic? Um, so my answer is uh, they're printing on photographic metallic paper, and then they're face mounting that paper onto one sheet of acrylic, and then there's the backing on top of that. So the photo image is sandwiched in between two, and then there's adhesive that is included in that process. Yes. So her, so her comment was um, related to, I guess, how she thought that these were bent, um, but they're flat. Um, and so when I go back to doo -doo -doo, the first shaped piece, there's not a lot of depth to it. It still appears pretty flat, but because of the perspective of it kind of drifting to one vantage point, that creates that sort of illusion of it's kind of floating out of somewhere. Whereas some of these others behind you have different angles, different shading. Um, so as I became more comfortable with the medium and the process of composition and how do I create illusion, um, I, f I, was, I felt like I was getting better at it, I guess. <laughs> yeah. And it's also hard when you're working, you know, your photo labs in New York and all this, you know, I'm working in Santa Fe. Um, so I'm not quite sure sometimes how these are going to turn out. Um, and sometimes I'm pleasantly surprised and sometimes I'm like, oh, that didn't come out so great. Um, so it just kind of depends on on how the process evolves, I guess. Thank you. Thanks. Right. Um, what happens in your head when you finally see the outcome from the screen? So his question. So his question is. <laughs> I'm sorry, the reason why I have to keep uh, repeating the questions is because we are streaming, and so they can't hear your question. Um, so um, I guess he was asking if, since there is somewhat of a detachment between 
when I create a piece on the screen and then have it created physically in another location. And in reflecting on what I said earlier about using a drone to photograph a landscape um, allowed me to get up close and personal without having to leave my mark on it. Um, is there a relationship between those two? Is that sort of what you're asking? Yeah. Um, I hadn't really thought about it th that way, but um, I don't know. It, it's, there's, there's things about being an artist today that are a lot easier than before. <laughs> um, because you can like create something, send it somewhere, and then get it back. Um, but there's that process or point where you're like, is this gonna be what I was really intending? And sometimes it's like unintended surprises. Um, and in some ways that's a good thing for me. Some ways it can be an expensive thing for me, which is not always great. Um, but I think I've become enough, I'm comfortable in this medium enough that it's okay for that experimentation. And I think with silk screening, part of the reason that I want to pivot some of my photography process to a silk screen process is because it will allow much more of a tactile experience for me as an artist. So I can see the imperfections of the printing process and the viewer can see more the artist's hand in something rather than in something that is fabricated like these photographs. I hope that answers your question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, with the O'Keeffe series, that was the only uh, photographic series where I used a drone. The rest of the time, I'm you know hiking out to these areas, and I'm I'm, I'm using a digital camera. So I am interacting with with the space. That one, I'm just, I was just glad that because it was either that or hiring an airplane or a helicopter, and again through technology and. Uh, changing times, we're able to experience or adapt to situations much more easily and for a less expensive uh, commitment. Any other question? Yes. So her question was, um, have I looked at Joseph Albert's work? And yes, I have. <laughs> I, le I left him off the list, um, but I have mentioned him in the past um, because these are basically my color and design theory class at Parsons School of Design, um, because it was always experimenting with, with these different effects that you get by layering colors on top of each other. And then looking at some of Albert's work that were based on uh, Mayan structures and architecture. Um, so yes, I'm, I'm very inspired by his work. And I have his book, it's in my library and it, it's like, you know, I have these series of books that are sort of like my Bibles and reference points that I like to go back to and just read and, and kind of um, look at, kind of maybe read ways that they see something and then it's like, oh, okay, maybe I'm kind of channeling them. <laughs>
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, thank you. Uh, any other questions? Okay. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>